Hello everybody, and welcome to episode number two of the Let's Learn Master of Puppets guitar series. Today we will be covering every single note, every single time change, every single chord progression, and a full detailed musical analysis of the title track, Master of Puppets by Metallica. A legendary track, no doubt, but what is the real meaning behind the song? Who is the master of puppets? Is it a metaphor for lack of self-control and the crippling effects of drug addiction? Perhaps it's Cliff Burton's former boss over at the Ragamuffin factory. Or maybe it has something to do with the Illuminati masters who control you, who own you, and only allow you to watch lackluster videos on YouTube due to their recommendation system. Today we are going to put an end to all this. We are either going to destroy the master itself, or become the master ourselves. Let's hit it. Master of Puppets is a long-form metal track, almost nine minutes in length. The first part of Master of Puppets is comprised of a unique intro and a series of verse pre-choruses and choruses that repeat a couple of times. The most notable difference between Master of Puppets and other tracks are its melodic bridge section, which features an arpeggiated chorus guitar and a two-part harmony up at the top. Now what makes this section distinct is within its abrupt change of tempo and feel, making it seem like there are almost two different songs within its length. There are also two equally iconic guitar solos being performed by both guitarists in the band, James Hetfield and Kirk Hammett. All in all, the entirety of Master of Puppets is undeniably iconic. Today we will uncover why throughout its guitar tracks and all of its various elements. The song begins with four iconic chord stabs within the key of E minor and then continues on to do a fully chromatic riff all the way down with downstrokes. Check this out. The first four chord stabs are on E. D, C sharp, and C, or 10th fret, 9th fret, and 8th fret. Now the C, the flat 6, is one of the most tense intervals that we can have, so that sets up the vibe for the rest of the song. Lots of tension being built right out of the gate. The line coming out of that sequence hits every single note in the chromatic scale extending downwards, so check this out. 12, 11, 10, 9, 8 as power chords. Those are the same chord stabs that we just played. And then, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, open, and then we repeat again. There's a little something I have to go over specifically regarding this chromatic riff that a lot of people get wrong. Here's what a lot of people do. Check out the ending. This is all good, but then... A lot of people just stop at that F sharp and don't give the F any showtime at all. If we don't play the F, we don't have a full chromatic scale, which disqualifies us from being a true Illuminati master of puppets. Let's check this again. Ready? Check it out. Wrong way. That's wrong. Doesn't even sound right. Here's the last part. You gotta make sure you get that 2-1 open. F sharp, F open. If you don't do that, you're a fool and a coward. Let's move on. Remember when I said that the flat six chord is one of the most tense chords that we can hit? Check out what bassist Cliff Burton has the audacity to do underneath that riff on the last time. That's right, he holds out a C throughout the entire drum fill and as those other notes are playing, creating all of that tension. The lone voice in the wilderness, and most certainly qualified to be an all-seeing Illuminati master. Out of the intro, we hit another hard stop into riff number two, which becomes the setup to the verse section. <laughs> This riff hinges upon hopping between two notes on the low E string and one note on the A, like this. E and F on the low E, B, C, and C sharp coming back down on the A string. Now let me play it slowly for you. It's all downstrokes and you want to palm mute just the E string. Check this out. Palm, palm, hit. Palm, palm, hit. Palm, palm, hit. Palm, palm, hit, hit. So we got a double note on that last one. Once again, palm, palm, hit. Palm, palm, hit. Palm, palm, hit. Just like that, all downstrokes nice and tight. 
Now this may come as a surprise, but this is basically the James Bond riff. Let me play it in that context for you. We got the B, the C, the C sharp to C, the 5, the flat 6, the natural 6, flat 6. Sounds just like it, right? That's because it is. The only difference is we have a pesky F on the bottom that makes it a Phrygian James Bond, or a flat 2 James Bond. And that's even more James Bond than even James Bond. Try to wrap your head around that. At the end of the first ascending and descending pattern, we hit a double B. The second time through, we're stopping at the C, so we're basically doing a half James Bond here, and then we come in with that power chord riff, but here's the whole thing. See that? We do a half James Bond going up, and then into that little power chord riff that goes G, F to E, sliding down to each one. Palm muting on the E's. So let me do that real slow again. Just like that. Here's the whole thing full speed. Bam. Fritchie and James Bond. Boom. You get the point. This little bit goes around two times and then comes into a longer version of itself. Check this out. of the riff completes the James Bond cycle two times instead of just one and has variations at the end of each repeat. The first of which being a double B that we saw earlier, the second being a quarter note B power chord, which kind of gives us a break in that rhythm. Remember, we're playing eighth notes straight through like this with no break until that little bit. So it's kind of nice to have that in there. Right after that, we continue with a double B followed by a half James Bond and the sliding power chords going into G, F, E like that. So we have really four different endings here that we're dealing with. Check this out. And then we start over, right? The second time around is almost completely identical, except that the ending, we tag on double the amount of slidey power chords. So I'm going to play this slowly for you. Check that out. Ready? is in 4-4, believe it or not, even though it sounds like it's skipping a beat, it's all just syncopated, but it lines up in the measure of 4. Very, 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 very cool. Cliff very tastefully plays through this by just outlining the E and the F on the bottom, and then accenting the B, which is the most impactful chord. It also foreshadows a riff that comes in much later in the track. After that lengthy James Bond sequence, we put aside our British spy aspirations and focus more on becoming a goddamn demon. This tiny transition riff uses first an octave jump and then goes up a tritone. Now ordinarily I'd simply refer to it as a tritone, but today my sensibilities have shifted to that of the medieval aristocracy, so I'll be referring to it as the devil's interval. Today I'm going to be burning all of you at the stake. That's right, it's called punching down, and we're going to be doing a lot of that today. We start on the low E, going up to the high E on the 7th fret of the A, moving up the devil's interval to that B flat. Now I would say use your middle finger for that, and you just go all the way down strokes like this, nice and fast. And you got to be really, really tight on the first two notes like this, and then let that last one hit a little bit harder. You want to accent that. pinch in there if uh, you want to put some salt and pepper on it. The verse riff follows a blues progression that plays off of an open E chug. Remember, all downstrokes. We start off with nine chugs on the low E string. And then we come into our first set of power chords, which goes like this. G, A, B flat, A, G, A. Okay, so we're always coming back to A. Flat third, fourth, flat fifth, so we have that tritone again. And then flat third to A again, fourth. So. And add a little extra E in between that uh, the second time around. Watch again. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The second time around, we have something slightly different. Start with the same amount of chugs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then we just do this. G, A to G, A, flat three to fourth, just two times. 
Now let's talk about something that absolutely needs to be addressed, and that is the myth that the second part of this riff is actually in a 2132 time signature. Now I love me some conspiracy theories, but somebody out there actually believes that this is the case. Talk about poisoning the well. This is even less believable than the flat earth theory. Yes, I could believe in the flat earth theory more than I could believe in the theory that this is in 2132. Do you honestly think that James Hetfield and Lars were just sitting around one day and James is like, hey man, this thing's in 2132, check it out. 1, 2, 5, 7, 9, 9, 9, 9, 21. And Lars is like, yeah, that's so cool, man. Thank goodness the math teacher put us together for this project. This is so cool. There's no way in hell that that happened. If that happened, if somebody came up to them and said this, especially during the 1980s, they came up to any member of Metallica, especially Cliff, he was a real ragamuffin, they would have spit right in your eyeball. And I can guarantee that. Here's a couple of more logical explanations for this phenomenon, okay? This, I believe, should be the mainstream narrative, not the alternative theory like YouTube wants us to believe. So we have nine chugs, correct? So we have to account for nine different notes. I'm going to say that's a measure of 9-8 going to a slightly slowed down measure of 2-4. All right, so we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 1, 2. And because of that slight slowdown, we can account for the amount of time it takes to get into the next part. Now we have one more logical explanation for this phenomenon, and that's that it could be a slightly faster measure of 3-4. Now, I believe that this is the most accurate way of describing this part, which I think would be more in the rhythmic lexicon of the Metallica boys. So check this out. One, two, three, four. Just like that, and it's not that hard to explain. All you have to do is just account for the fact that they were playing out of time, slightly faster or slightly slower depending on how you want to perceive the time signature. That is it. Now there's no simple way to really explain the creative process of 1980s Metallica because, let's admit it, trying to get into all that stuff is very, very, very difficult, very esoteric, but I'm just giving you a simple explanation for something that people want to complexify and analyze into the ground, making it no longer fun to think about or play anymore. Let's move on. This riff is exactly the same as the last, but it's one whole step higher. I'm going to call this the Flat Earth Blues and F Sharp Minor. same rhythmic nonsense we talked about just before, but we're on the second fret of the low E string, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then we're going to do this. All we're doing is holding on to the fourth fret of the D string, playing the open A, and then hammering into the second fret to make a B chord, just like this, and then going up to a C back to B. It's all the same intervals as last time, but now we're playing it on the A and D string. So once again, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. transition out of that with a series of eighth notes going through four beats on B. One and two and three and four minute. Okay, and that's all there is to that part, and then we finally get to move into the next section. The pre-chorus gives us some more busy chord movement and also introduces the master master motif. <laughs> with two power chords going between each other, an E5 and a D5 at the 7th fret of the A string and the 5th fret, like this. With those chugs in between, make sure you're playing that exact rhythm. We then continue with this little ditty like this. Make sure you're using those exact fingers, so pointer here on the 7th, ring on the 9th, ring up on the 9th again, barring into it, back to the 9th, and then hammering into the pinky for the 10th tiny little vibrato and in total you get this. We come into a B power chord on the seventh fret of the low E string like this. One, two, three, four, C, B. Going up a half step then back down a half step. Phrygian motion. Then we come back onto the C and we do this. One, two, three, four, D sharp, B. So that's sort of the same motion between E and C but it's D sharp to B. All right, that's pretty interesting. Now, usually we don't use a straight up D sharp five to represent the five chord. We'd use that 
right? The sixth fret here and the ninth fret there to create a B in first inversion. But we're not doing that. We're using a straight up power chord. It's simpler yet harmonically more complex. So, all in total, nice and slow. Little ditty. B, C, B, C, D e sharp B, boom. And then we repeat once again. On the fourth time around, instead of playing the D sharp to B, we play a short little harmony riff between the two guitars that represents a B7 chord. The first one on the bottom goes like this. So that's at the ninth fret to the seventh to the sixth on the A string going F sharp, E, D sharp, okay, which is the fifth, fourth, and third scale degrees. And then coming to D sharp, C, B, or six on the A, going to eight, seven on that one right there. So we got that harmonic minor motion going. It's a raised seventh scale degree instead of a flatted seventh. So that's what the sound we're getting. Very Egyptian. The high harmony starts up here. And we're going 12, 10, 9, which is A, G, F sharp, or flat 7, flat 6, 5, to 9, 7, 6, which is the same as we started on with the lower harmony. Okay, so the first one of the lower harmony is the second one of the top harmony. Makes sense, right? Now we can get on with one of the most important and iconic portions of the song the Master of Puppets chorus section. Check it out. begins with two chords going along with a chant that calls for master master the hook of the song those two chords are E and F and you just want to hit them nice and tight like that that's the one to the flat two and the vocal on top is singing just the root note so it's master master just as simple as that however the rest of the chorus is melodically and harmonically in E minor so this Phrygian part only happens during the master chants the first three chords of the melodic portion go through E, F sharp, and G with a little break on that flat three chord of the relative major. Now you want to really make sure that you're chugging E in this exact spot before you hit the F sharp and before you hit the G. So da, 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 da. have a little break there, and then we come into the third fret of the A string on C. C, bum, 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 B to A. We have the same break, but this time on A. Now I do want to mention that we hit now the A string in between, okay? So no E string here, but we're still chugging in the same rhythm. And then we immediately hit up to D, C, and B, which is the same three chords in sequence, but up a step, okay? So we're still in the key of E minor. D. Something. I chugged a G in the middle of that. No more open strings. Now, I always thought that we had to chug E through each of these chords, which I was completely wrong about. So, I'm learning something here, too. We got that D to C, B. And we land on that 5 chord for a little bit. Then we immediately come up to here. 7th fret, 5, 3. Now, that's an E to D to C. Or one flat seven flat six. That's the Iron Maiden chord progression. We come back into the master, master chance, and then we do this F sharp, but C this time. Okay, so instead of going to G, we're going to C, a tritone away from that F sharp. Dissonant, but very melodic in this context. Let's do that whole thing slow. D, F sharp, G, C. master master ends the entire thing. So we can count this in a double time meter that's been the feel throughout the entire song so far, but I don't believe that that encapsulates the actual overarching meter of the song. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to count it out loud for you. One, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four, 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 one, two,
Did you notice something about all that? We were only counting with twos and fours. Now that, I don't think, adds a lot of value to our count. And I think it could be incredibly confusing since the tempo is moving so fast and we only have two numbers to refer to. Instead, I'm going to cut this double time feel into a half time feel. Alright, so this time I'm going to go through it slower. Check this out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four. part is in seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven, master, master. So you see how much easier that is to count, and it also gives us a lot more of a different value system to go off of. We have seven, seven, five, and six, instead of just fours and twos. This makes a lot more sense when you're really trying to feel the overarching meter, and I think it's a lot more helpful when you're actually counting it playing as well. When chorus one is complete, we come back into the same verse setup riff as before, but minus the diabolical tritones. We then make our way through another verse, but this time Cliff Burton plays a tiny little variation that changes the harmonic value a little bit. Check this out. Now this is for people with really finely tuned ears. Cliff Burton was actually playing a D and an E for a couple of those instead of the root notes G to A. That actually changes the harmonic structure quite a bit. We're turning those chords into second inversion. So we have G and A, okay, the roots being G and A, obviously, and the fifth is D to E, exactly what Cliff just played there. So he's playing the fifth as the bass note on the bottom of those two chords. Just adds a little more gravel at the bottom, if you know what I'm talking about. The pre-chorus and chorus sections play through exactly how they did. But as soon as we're finished, we are greeted with probably the most abrupt and radical shift that you could possibly have in every area, starting with this master being detuned gradually. Master! 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 That is then followed by a beautiful arpeggiated electric guitar sequence. moves through a series of relatively basic open chords starting on E minor. We go up the first four notes like this and then into a D chord immediately after. Hammering on and pulling off that sus2 coming into what looks like a sus4. Let's hear those two again. Got E minor to D with the hammer on. Letting notes ring out by the way to give it a nice flourishing effect. We then hit into the C add 9 shape, 3rd fret of the A, 2nd fret of the D, and 3rd fret of the B string just like that, and we go. So at the very last second we have to lift off that ring finger and play the open B string. That creates a C major 7. So we're really going C add 9. You want to make sure you're hitting these arpeggios exactly how they're written. A, G, B, G, B, G, D, B. Now here, you want to make sure you're using your ring finger on the second fret of each of these chord voicings, because we're going to have the open A here, hitting the A string, G, and B. That's almost like an A add 9, but I'll get to that in just a second. Then we hit B. So that's why I wanted you to use the ring finger there so you can put the middle finger on the second fret. And then, to cap it off, we go to D sharp on the first fret of the D. Okay? So that's why we have to keep that ring there once again. All part of a B7 chord, by the way. These are all inversions. Third inversion to root position to first inversion. And then, a very last note with the pinky the third fret of the low E string, which is a G, the flat third moving right back into the beginning of the progression again. Let's talk about the rhythm a little bit. The total amount of beats that exist during this section are 16. Okay, that's why the drum groove is so straightforward. However, the way that the chords are divided into these beats is not so straightforward. We hit the first chord E minor for two beats. One, two, just like that. Then we hit D for four, three, four, C for four, two, three, four, then each of these for two. One, two, one, two, 
One, two, adding to a total of 16. The second time through, we add these little volume swells on top. Check it out. Those swells go up every single note of the E harmonic minor scale except for one. Check this out. We start on E, second fret of the D, F sharp, which is the two, G, which is the flat third, A, B, and then D sharp right into E, and that fades out. Now, if that little chord progression wasn't good enough, we add a harmony, a dueling harmony guitar on the very top. Check out this. That's just absolutely beautiful sounding. Now we're starting up at the 17th fret of the B string. This is on the root note. Now this lower harmony follows the chord progression pretty exactly. So check this out. Starting up on the 17th, going up to the 19th and 15th of the E. So we're actually going up and coming back down. So that is an E minor arpeggio. Root, fifth, flat, third, root. And then we immediately go to a D arpeggio, but starting at the perfect fifth right up top. A little double note here, coming back down again. And then we go to a C arpeggio, which is at the 15th, 12th, and the 13th. So let me do that slow. 17, E minor, D, double dub, D, D, C arpeggio, dub, dub, dub. C, and then we hit into the B arpeggio, which is handled like this. Go to the 17th fret of the high E string, do a hammer on and a pull off. Go to the D sharp right here, which is the 11th fret, and then come to the 13th and the 12th of the B. So, definitively harmonic minor right there. Very nice sound. We finish that off using the 12, 13, and 15 here. And those slides are very important as well. Check that out. So I'm going normal, normal, slide, normal. See how I took my pointer finger and snuck it in at the end there? Watch again. Slide, pointer, and then coming right into this, slide, ring, back into the beginning again. That articulation is incredibly important. If you don't hit that, then both of the guitars are going to be slightly out of sync. We come around to play it one more time. Here's the whole thing slow. Ready? Double dub. Double dub. Slide. Slide. So now that brings us into Kirk's part, which is the higher harmony. We start off on a G, 20th fret of the B string, so we're a minor third above the original note that James was playing. And we're going like this. We're using pretty much the opposite chord shapes. So instead of using a minor chord shape, we're going to use a major chord shape. So really we're playing G major on top of this, which creates an E minor 7. But check this out. Ready? 20, 22, 19, 20. That represents E minor hitting the flat 7th on top. We go right into this next shape. That's actually a diminished shape, an F sharp diminished shape, but because the root note is D, we're creating a D7. The C natural on top is a flatted 7th, going to here and going to the major 3rd, right? So, boom, D7, double dub, D7, and then this. That's the original chord shape that we were playing on James's part, but this is the final shape of Kirk's part. This creates a C major 7 chord because we have the B up top. Now check that out slow. Double dub. Double dub. Pretty cool, huh? And everything matches up perfectly within the articulation as well. Now check out how we end it. We come up with the same 17 15th fret hammer on pull off to the 14th fret and then hitting the root note on the 17th of the B. Then we continue to do the exact same rhythm as before, but this time we're on D sharp. Slide back down, 
slide up, and then start over again. So now check out that whole thing. G major shape for E minor 7. D7, double dub, D7, dub, man, bum, bum, and a C major 7. End it. Slide normal. Slide normal, boom. Now there's one little thing, and it's very anomalous. This is an anomaly of a thing that exists on Master of Puppets. One in which it took me 20 plus years to actually hear. I did not know that this existed at all. Kirk actually ends on the G, but then immediately hits an F sharp right after that. Now if you notice, James Hetfield ended with an E. Now a G and an E makes sense. That's a minor third interval, and sounds very consonant with one another. Just like that. But, if we have an F sharp on top and an E on the bottom, you create this. That's a major second. To me, that always sounded like teeth chattering, okay? It starts off with the flat third going to the major second, and it holds it out unabashedly. That teeth chattering is really powerful there, and uh, I never really noticed it until I listened to the isolated tracks, so... Unbelievable. That's gonna have to be for a separate video. I think I'm gonna make a separate video for that one. The next set of chords brings us into a double time feel with an amazing melodic guitar solo by James Hetfield. That's right, James Hetfield playing the solo. Check it out. solo hits every single mark, especially when it comes to lining up with the chord progression. Here's the very first part. Check it out. Ready? Perfectly follows along all of the chords in the progression. We start off on the 12th fret sliding into the E string, right? Then we go up 12, 14, 15 with the middle and ring fingers and then slowly and gradually come up the scale. 14, 15, 17 and then back down. So check that out again. 12, 12, 15, 14, 17. After that little climb up the scale we hit our peak with the 19th fret and the 15th fret with this arpeggio. That's all those notes in a little tiny block of time. And the rhythm is actually pretty tricky. You have to play it like this. Da -dum -da -dum -da. That's almost five notes in the span of one beat, okay? And you have to land on that last one right on the downbeat. We hit into the next section, which starts off with two whole step bends being released, like this. And then a little melodic section. That 15th fret is actually bending up into the root note, E, and then coming back down into the flat seven and doing that twice exactly identical each time. Then we come up to the 15th and 14th on the high E down to the 12th on the B. With that same type of motion. A very tense motion as well because that high note G is a minor sixth away from B. We all know how tense that one is. After that we go with a really fast trill between the 12th and the 15th fret. A very melodic way of coming out of that. So... And the third part of this second half goes like this. Very, very, very nice way of using a double stop bend. Something that occurs in a lot of guitar solos, but the way that James plays and articulates this just makes it so unique sounding. I'll play it one more time. Yeah. That brings us into the second half of this solo, which is another time through the chord progression. So we're back on the root note E minor. We come right into the first lick of the second half with something that's in D major. Okay, so check this out. It's all outlining different notes within the D major scale, or a D major chord shape. Okay, so we're starting on the root at the 12th fret, and then going 12, 14, 12, to 11. That's dancing around the perfect fourth. Okay, so we're going fourth, fifth, fourth, and major third. So if we have a D major chord, we're just playing that middle note right there. 
then just some rhythmic variation coming back. Then we hit the C right on the downbeat, just like we did with the first half. We ended the first half with that, remember. After that hard downbeat C, we come into this lick. So that's just a scalar thing. We're starting on the low note A, coming up almost an A minor type of shape. It's really an A Dorian shape because that's the, uh, the scale that corresponds within the key of E minor. But we're going up like this, 12, 9, 10, okay? And then continuing like this, 9, 10, 12, 10, 12, 14, da, da. So real slow again. as well to keep that uh, nice rhythmic pulse going. A beautifully melodic scale part and it ends almost as if we're in a major key. If we didn't have the chords behind it, I would say that this is definitively G major. Check it out. See how that ends? It just sounds so happy, but because of the context of what we're in, it's not so happy but it is absolutely incredible. We ended off with something that centers around the 12th fret of the B string like this. You do a 12 to 12 on B and G, and then come up to here. A nice resolution that goes into the B chord because that's an F sharp up top. And then we go like this. That's actually a B7 sus4 shape, just arpeggiated. We're going D sharp on the 11th fret, and then coming back down from the 12th with a hammer on and a pull off, a 12 10, which is the root and the flat seventh. So here we have major third, fourth, resolving back to the third. We all know how important sus fours are. And then root to flat seven. Immediately followed by this incredibly tricky slide. We have to go all the way up to the 19th fret like this. And you can't miss that either. If you miss it, you're sunk and it's gonna sound terrible. Otherwise, it's gonna sound like this. I've heard it sound like that live before. Don't be like James Hetfield, except you might wanna be like James Hetfield, very creative individual. Following James's solo, we come back into the dueling guitar harmony so we can hear that beautiful layering once again. Immediately following that, we hit into the same arpeggiated chord sequence that's been going on for the last, uh, I don't even know how many times, eight times, and we hit it with some distortion like this. shapes remain the same as the previous clean section, but we have the distortion on now, and the most important thing is to make sure the articulation is aggressive and using a lot of palm mutes. So just like this, E minor, D, see how staccato that is? Only certain notes run free. Take notes on that. Underneath those mutes are held out power chords outlined in the chord progression. We're starting up like this. It's a D, three, four, C, and then open A, B, D sharp power chords. So once again, just like in the pre-chorus, we're hitting a regular old power chord there. Now that we're finally finished going through this melodic bridge section, let's talk about the genius behind it. It's the same exact thing 10 times in a row but each time it builds and does something different. The first time it's just playing by itself, right? And the second time we have the volume swells up top, right? Boom, boom, boom. That adds a little more interest. The third and fourth time we have the dueling harmonies going. We know how important that is. Pretty self-explanatory. And then James Hetfield comes in between the next two times to play a guitar solo. The rhythm guitar is playing a guitar solo. Unbelievable. And lead vocalist. That guy is unbelievably talented. Coming back into the repetitive part, which is the dueling guitar harmony, which I don't mind hearing over and over and over again. It's beautiful. And then the very last time, it's just played with distortion and power chords in the background. It's the same thing ten times through to kill quite a decent amount of time couple minutes, I'd say. Awesome. The next section is loosely based upon the second riff that we heard that set up the verse way earlier in the song, but slower and almost like a dirge. Check it out. We wind up now a whole step 
step up in the key of F sharp now instead, but with a lot of the same intervallic content that we had. So we're starting off on the F sharp like this. Double. So remember those double notes from way before? We're doing that same thing, but with a slower, more dirgy rhythm. The second time around, we hit that C sharp as well. Look at this. Double. And full power chord hitting on a quarter note, which is also remaining consistent from the earlier part. Pretty cool, huh? We continue on a whole slew of times going through the master motif once again. Now I'm starting to think these guys are getting a little lazy. Haven't we heard the master motif enough times? No, we've never heard the master motif ever once in this song because I'm the Illuminati master. And I'm going to memory hole everything you thought you knew about this song. Maybe that's what the melodic bridge part is for, to memory hole everything we heard beforehand because it's so much different. See how this works? I'm manipulating your mind. Laughter, laughter, all I hear or see is laughter, 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 laughing at my prize. Now, we come up on that G, which in the key that we were just in is the flat 2 of the F sharp. But we're actually going to resolve back into E very quickly. So we're using the G now as a pivot, a flat 3 of the E going into F sharp, right into E as if nothing happened, as if we never went up a whole step, which we absolutely did. Another memory holding moment. At the very end of that, we gotta hit this. That's the part right there. 3-2 open, 3-2 open. It's kind of hard to hear in the recording because there's so much going on with James's high vocal screech right before the guitar solo, but that's the main part that I can derive out of this. Go like this. So in total, That's the main part, I'd say. Now, since there are so many guitar parts playing at the same time, if you want to faithfully recreate this, you need to do a couple slides with a couple different guitars, because there are about six guitars, I think, layered on top of each other here. A ridiculous amount of guitars to make it super heavy in the production process. Yeah, you're going to want to do some slides coming in on a couple of them, and then one of them just splits off and just plays this chord for the second part, like this. just holds it out while the other one does it twice. Listen to this, it's a, like a big cacophony of nonsense. Check it out. And that all serves to bring us into the guitar solo, which I think needs no introduction. But here I am introducing it. Check it out. guitar goes, there's nothing really to talk about for this solo. It's just a verse riff happening just with a solo on top. The first lick of the solo starts up at the 17th fret of the high E string, and we're doing this pull-off type of idea followed by an alternate picking idea. So we do this, 17 to 12, and then pick 13, 12, 13, back up to 12, and then commence once again. We do that a total of three times. And then we go to the 15th fret the very last time, completing the entire pattern. The picking pattern is very specific, so you're going to want to follow that. We're going down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, until you get it at that full speed. And the second time, we have to account for that short measure. Remember that silly flat earth theory style uh, verse rhythm I was talking about? 2132? <laughs> we have to shorten up the 15th fret pull off just a little bit, like this. And then coming right back into it again. So we do the whole thing twice, but with that shortened part on the second ending each time. Check it out. Here's the full thing slowly. And it utilizes some even more interesting melodic devices. We're basically going between an A minor 9, we got the A up top, the E, the C, and the B. Alright, that's the root, fifth, flat third, and second, which would be an A minor 9. Then that very last one would be a C major 7. 
right? So A minor 9, three times, and then C major 7 all on top of an E minor progression, so it's a lot of tension going on. The A is actually the 11th up top, or the 4th, and the C is the flat 6. Once again, we keep coming back to that flat 6. I'm starting to notice a pattern here. The second part, we come into a tremolo picking section, where we're going all the way up to the 19th fret and coming down the scale. And then at the very end, hitting the 15th fret of the B string. So 19, 17, 15, 14, 17, 15, 14, 15 on the B. And then this nice bend. Almost like that James Hetfield bend during the first solo. Is Kirk trying to steal his ideas? I think so. But the much more difficult part about this is that we have this pull-off section going from 17, 15 to 14. Really, really quickly, like this. Just like that, so all legato. And then coming right up to the 17th fret and sliding into the 19th like this. And then playing this scale pattern all the way down. All legato, look. That's incredibly difficult to get all those notes out, but somehow it's very natural sounding. Look at this. Here's that whole little bit slow. slide we hit quite possibly the most annoying part to play of any Metallica solo and I'm not joking these are two natural harmonics at the third fret just in different spots first one happens right around here so that's right in the middle of the third fret so if you can hit that sweet spot right there you'll get it the next one is slightly higher you see that so it brings up an even higher note an even higher harmonic but it's on the same fret Okay, so those two together, just like that. This part's a little bit easier. This is just kind of like an F sharp minor pentatonic run, uh, but we're still in the key of E, which is odd, which leaves us with the F sharp being the ninth. And we're actually focusing on that F sharp as well, but it goes like this. Starting off in the fourth fret, pulling off into the second on the G string, going to D and back up. Then to do another pull off here, four two, and then two two four with that nice hammer on. It's a tasty hammer on at the end too. Four, and that brings us into our next riff, which actually ends the E minor portion of the program. So we're going like this now. All notes in the E natural minor scale, starting on the D up top, which is the tenth fret. 10, 8, 7, 10 on the B, and then 8, 7, 10, 8, and then 7, 8, 10, 7. Eventually resolving to a B right there, so. All alternate pick. And then a little tremolo line right after the fact. We then continue that theme of tremolo picking up the E minor scale like this. And this is actually going to bring us into F sharp minor eventually, but I'll show you where that happens. So we go... Just like that. So we have that first pattern at 7, 8, 10, going back down, we do that two times. 8, 10, 12, coming back down, we do that two times. 10, 12, 14, 12, 10, come back down, we do that two times. And then this one, we only do one time to account for that short measure at the end of that verse. So check it out. Just like that. And then we slide up into this position. And we do that a total of four times. One, two, three, four. And that's 17, 15, 14, 19, 17, 14, okay? But just with that really fast tremolo picking in there. And just coming downward as well. We're not going down and then back up. Just a descending motion all the way through. Right after that, we have a series of bends. It's a unison bend, 17th fret of the B, 14th fret of the E. Just like that, kind of uh, haphazardly doing it as well. And then we do a, a couple double pull-offs, 19th and 14th fret and then back into the haphazard bends. Then we continue those unison bends moving up the scale, but in a very particular manner. It's not really up the scale, there's some chromatic notes in there. We're going, and then go up a half step, whole step, half step, half step, and 
with an extremely volatile bend at the 22nd fret going all the way up to an E, okay? So we're bending 22 up to 24 and wanking on the whammy bar as hard as we possibly can as well. After Kirk Hammett's extremely spastic whammy horse, we come into a riff that's quite possibly one of Metallica's heaviest riffs. And it's also based on that second intro riff that we keep bringing back. What's that, like the sixth time already? Jesus. The other cool thing is that this riff plays along with the way that Cliff interpreted the original riff at the beginning of the song. Check it out. So it's exactly the same. He's riding between the F and the B, just like this riff right now. See that? We're riding between the F and the B. <laughs> and we basically do the whole thing twice. Now, let's talk about how we play it a little bit. We start with two chugs, really, really heavy chugs, okay? Like this. Dun, dun. And then a big F power chord, nice and free. We do the same thing four times. Double B. So we're bringing back that double B once again. Remember, we don't forget this the entire way through the song. It's pretty unbelievable how consistent we have been. It's almost like this is the same thing over and over again. And then the second time around, we go like this. Single B to give even more weight to that last chord, just on that quarter note. So, oh yeah. One of the heaviest riffs that they have. All the way in 1986. And then of course we transition once again, I believe this is probably the fourth time we're doing this, with eighth note chugs over four beats. But this time we're just on E. And we go into the next section. This next riff is completely unique to this section. We don't see anything quite like it anywhere else in the song, except maybe the very introduction when we're just going between E minor and C. Those are the two chords here, the one and the flat six. So maybe there is some consistency here. I don't know. I'm just grasping at straws at the moment. So we start off like this. We go all the way up to E minor scale in that position. So we start with our open pointer middle pinky Pointer, middle, pinky, pointer, ring, pinky, and then land on C. Okay, let's do that again. O, two, three, five, two, three, five, two, four, five, three. And we hit that C, which is implied that that is a C major because we're in the key of E minor. And then we do a double C like this. Da -da -dun, dun, 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 three, two, open. So just follow that sequence exactly how it is. Once again, we're only using notes in the E minor scale. Nothing really too crazy. But the crazy thing is we are using all downstrokes. So yes, even though this seems a little too fast for us to be using downstrokes, the articulation is suggesting that that's what we're doing. And also, if you watch James Hetfield play this, he plays it like that. So, double one. Da -da 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 Double it up, 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 up. All downstrokes. And we're connecting each of those little scale sections with those E chugs in between for four beats, right? Check that out again. Double up, 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 E chug. And then back in. On the third time through, a little harmony comes in over the top, so it's a high harmony acting in thirds. Check out how it sounds with the original part. All we're doing is creeping in toward the very end on those last four ascending notes and going like this. And then we're going like this downward. Everything there is a third, either major or minor, depending on where you are in the scale. Uh, but then the last two notes are perfect fourths above the root, which is a little too stupid, but uh, it does sound pretty good when you play it fast. Oh yeah. Boom, and then we're out. On the last ending, we hit a C power chord at the very end. 
we double up on this part. And then just hold out the E, do it again, and then we're back into the next riff. Now Lars joins in on the fun there, so let me play it one more time. Power chord. Lars. No Lars. No Lars. No Lars. We're back into this riff, by the way. Yeah, not too much to say about that. Right after that part, the verse plays all over again, the pre-chorus plays all over again, and the chorus plays all over again exactly how it was previously. So no variations of any of those sections. Pretty monotonous, actually, considering how amazing this song is. It's monotonous, yet amazing at the same time. Makes you want to hear that chorus over and over again, right? After we're done with all that, the outro is what happens, and it's basically the same as the verse riff, but Lars is playing a completely different drum groove to give it a lot of difference in terms of its variation. So check this out. The main difference here is that the snare drum is hitting on beats one and three, instead of two and four like it has been for the rest of the song. This is a very slick way of playing something the same, yet slightly different. Good job, Lars. He's really good at that, by the way. The only other thing to go over, aside from James Hetfield's obnoxious belly laughter at the end, is this outro lead that happens. Now, I'm pretty sure it's a reverse delay effect, but I'm going to show you how to play it forwards. Check this out. For the sake of demonstration, I'm going to play it bone dry for you. No delay like I just showed you with. But we have this, the 12th fret of the G going to the 11th fret, which is a 9th. Okay, we hit it twice, and then we go like this. 14, 15, 12 on the B string. Now that's a Dorian mode right there, okay? C sharp is the natural 6th, and we're still in the key of E minor, so we have to keep that in mind. And then we go like this. So messing around with that A type of scale motion, once again, we've done that in the solo as well. Seems like Kirk likes to use that C sharp whenever he can, even if you're playing on top of an E. Now Kirk probably doesn't know what he's doing here, or maybe he does, who knows? I don't really know, I'm just speculating, but it sounds cool. That's the only reason why we're doing it. We continue up that pattern going in perfect fourths up the 12th, 14th, and 15th fret. Now this offers almost a jazzy type of approach. This is something a lot of the jazz guys do. They play in quartal or fourth type of voicings. Tell me that doesn't sound like some kind of freedom jazz dance that uh, Miles Davis would play. And then we go like this. And then let the delay take over from the very ending. Now after James Hetfield's final laugh, we're greeted with yet even more guitar. At the end of the song, Kirk Hammett's still going with this reverse delay effect, so let's just check out those last few notes. So we come in like this, on the 10th and the 12th fret going to the 9th fret on the G, okay? That's the root note E, we finally hit that. And then we go like this, we come down to the 7th fret, and then we go up this B minor shape, and then end on A once again, okay? Now this is like Do, Re, Me, which is 1, 2, flat, 3, coming down to the A. Now it's very interesting that we hit that A, we've been seeing that A all over this entire song. And even though we're in the key of E, if you play an A major shape, having a natural G on top, you're just utilizing the Dorian mode, just like I've been talking about. So it's really not that far out of the box, but it is very interesting and colorful, no doubt. Alright everybody, thanks so much for coming along on this journey. We are finished with the title track, Master of Puppets. All almost nine minutes of music. Give yourselves a pat on the back. We went through a bunch of riffs, a bunch of unique riffs. We went through an entire melodic bridge, two guitar solos, two harmony sections. I'm telling you, this band is more like a prog rock band by the day. It's kind of crazy how they were at these early albums. Very adventurous, very fun incredibly creative and inspiring music too. Not like some of the more boring stuff that they did later on, you know, but we won't get into that, all right? I don't wanna get my hot takes over here too hot right at the beginning, you know what I'm saying? 
So yeah, if you want to further support the channel, go to www.subscribestar.com slash RomanOverMusic. You can give any amount of money you want per month. $1, $5, $10, $30, $50, $100, or whatever you want to give. It helps this channel out immensely with your patronage. You can also give a tip on my PayPal tip jar. That's just a one-time donation if you like what you see. And uh, other than that, I got nothing else to say. I'm pretty pooped after that long session of breaking down this song. Come along for episode number three. Anybody who knows the album knows what it is. I don't have to tell you. Goodbye, all. Peace out.